So uh, what I thought today, tonight I'd do is give you a little bit of a update of kind of where we are with the Huntington Beach wetlands and of the projects we're working on for the near future, what we're looking on for short term and what we're looking at for longer term, just so that everybody's aware of what we're doing down at our neck of the woods. Um, I usually start off a lot of these conversations with where the other wetlands, but I think you guys already knew that. So I, I don't, I'm hoping I don't have to continue saying that with this group. Okay, so as we both know, there's two sets of wetlands in Huntington Beach, the Bolsa Chica wetlands further northwest from us up along PCH, and us, this tiny little group down here called the Huntington Beach wetlands across from the state beach in, um, in Huntington Beach, southeastern Huntington Beach. So these are our marshes. Uh, so we have the Tabra Marsh, where our inlet is uh, at the very southeast, then Brookers Marsh and Magnolia Marsh. And there's an area up to the left I'll talk about in a little bit, but I'll give you a little hint right now. It's called Newland Marsh, and this is a piece of property. If you can see my cursor, it's right here along uh, Newland Street where Hamilton ends. And there's another piece up here, which we call Newland West, and then, excuse me, Newland North. And then Newland West is this whole stretch here, and it's actually broken up into two pieces. We are about four weeks away from closing the deal on that and having it in our name. Uh, for the Heidi Beach Wetlands Conservancy. We, I was able to get all two and a half million dollars that allow us to purchase the, um, the property from Caltrans, the current owner. So who we are, we're just a group of concerned citizens. We've been around since 1985 with the indirect, uh, indirect intent of buying property, restoring it and maintaining it. We are a 501c3. We currently own 140 acres with another 49.4 that we're going to be getting. So that'll put our numbers at 189 acres that, we'll be, that we will own and be responsible for. Um, the anticipated land acquisition cost and restoration is a little bit higher um, now than we originally thought. Um, it's about another million dollars more than that for the restoration of um, Newland Marsh. So again, we acquire, restore, and protect the coastal wetlands of southeastern Huntington Beach. And we try to bring, when we do the restoration, we try to uh, restore it back to as natural a state as we can. I say that mainly because we kind of have to do somewhat of a reverse flow because in the past, 100 years ago, the uh, ocean water would have swept across uh, from the ocean into our property and then proceeded along this normal path up to about Atlanta Boulevard. And uh, now we actually have to reroute it to go through Talbot Marsh, head sort of west, go into Brookers Marsh, head further west and go into Magnolia Marsh. And then we're gonna have to go a little bit northwest to go into um, Newland Marsh when we do that. So it's not a natural flow, the way we're gonna have to do things when we do the restorations. So I don't know if anybody, everybody knows this, but we are currently the largest private landowner in the city of Huntington Beach. It used to be the Boeing Company, but they have sold off so much property in Huntington Beach that we are now number one, and that's without Newland Marsh. So our current board members, um, it's pretty much the same that you people have known for quite some time. We've had some additional uh, individuals that have come on board, Jacqueline Broach, she's a, um, a realtor here in Huntington Beach, Southeast Huntington Beach. Mr. Greg Gardner, who's a teacher out of Edison High School, and he was also one of 2018's California Teacher of the Year. I brought him on board as one of our um, board members uh, about two years ago now. It was right after he made Teacher of the Year, as a matter of fact. Mr. Brian Zitt, who works at, at Ecorp uh, Consulting, who's a s senior aquatic biologist, and then we have an ex officio uh, board member, which is James O'Malley, part of the Shop Off Realty Investment Group. So historical, 2,950 acres made up the um, wetlands down in south, southeastern Huntington Beach. Present is 127. When we get through with Newland Marsh, it'll be 176 acres. That's only about 6% of what used to be here at one time. So... What does that look like? Well, here's what it looks like today. So you can see the, the same picture I showed you before, Huntington Beach wetlands down in the southeast corner. This is how much used to be wetlands down in uh, southeastern Huntington Beach. 
It went a little past Atlanta Boulevard along the San Anne Riverbed and the Costa Mesa Bluff, and what's sometimes referred to as the Huntington Beach Bluff, at least on the southeastern side, um, up through uh, Beach Boulevard, and like I said, all the way up to just a little bit past Atlanta. So some of the projects we're working on, and we'll go into a little bit of depth on this, is we were working on uh, the Bird's Beak Project, uh, which is an endangered species of plant. We'll be installing a living shoreline project in our Talbert Marsh. We will be doing a small restoration for Upper Magnolia Marsh. We have a project we're working on with Edison High School to, uh, we have some growing tanks and I'll show you what those look like. Uh, so we're studying cord grass and then of course the acquisition in Newland Marsh. So our Birch Beak project, this actually has been a five year project. We started it in, 20, in 2015 with a small grant we received from US Fish and Wildlife to look at the potential of uh, growing plants within our, our marshes. We seeded um, about 500 seeds along this edge right here. You see where the two red lines are at in Magnolia Marsh. This is along the western edge. Um, and we, even though there was a lot of literature that was out there that told us where we to expect uh, salt marsh bird's beak to grow, we also wanted to look at it in our particular marshes with the soil content, the soil makeup to see if we would meet the, what is in the literature. So we gridded out an area, we um, staked out mean high tide, we seeded areas um, a square meter below mean high tide and a square meter above mean high tide in four different spots. We seeded the area, nothing came out in 2016, and then we had about 200 plants that came out in 2017. And it pretty much followed the, um, the literature that suggested just above mean high tide is sort of the sweet spot for salt marsh birds beak to grow. Then we received additional funding in 2018, 19, and 20 through Orange County Community Fund. Um, it looks like we're gonna be in line to get additional funding from them in 2021. Um, and we, because of that, we are now listed as the eighth site in California that has this endangered species of plant. What we did is we extended the planting, you can see in the orange and the green, but we also extended on some of the islands and also along the dunes within Brookhurst Marsh, excuse me, Magnolia Marsh, Brookhurst and Talbert Marsh. Um, in so doing that throughout the three years, we've gone from the original 200 plus plants to last year's count was over 5,000 plants we now have in our marshes. So we've been really successful in bringing this, this plant back. Uh, we're, we have a, a variety of different things we, that are, make it possible for us to do this. We do a community event in our marshes uh, the third Saturday of the month. So we have a lot of folks that come out and help us with weeding, um, planting pollinator plants to support the salt marsh bird's beak, uh, staking out areas, uh, putting up protective fencing because evidently the cottontails we have in our marshes absolutely love uh, salt marsh bird's beak leaves, leaves. So we've had to fence around those to make sure that they don't eat this endangered species. Um, <clears throat> so we've been very successful in um, bringing this plant back and into our marshes. We're going to continue doing that for 2021. It looks like we're going to seed probably an additional 2,000, excuse me, 10,000 seeds uh, within the marshes. We're now going to do a little bit more on the islands themselves to try to bring the plants back. And then we're looking at in preparation when we do the restoration for Newland Marsh to see those, uh, the Newland Marsh as well. Probably not in, in what we call Newland East, but definitely in the Newland West area. So it's been a very successful program for us. Uh, we've been really happy with the results of going from 200 plus to over 5,000 plants. And it's um, such a good program that the Orange County Community Fund, this will be the fourth year in a row that they've funded us. We have received money from Squirp for this program as well and also from uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife. So they seem to think it's a good project as well. Living Shoreline Project. So now we're looking at the Talbert Marsh and along the eastern edge and the southeastern edge, we have the eastern edge here, what we call Reach 2. This is this area right here, the eastern edge. And the southeastern edge goes from this riprap along here. There's been a lot of scouring in this area as a result of wind and water action. So in 26, well, <clears throat> let me back up. We've seen, excuse me, uh, half a foot um, erosion per year for the last 10 years. 
we had a study done by Moffat and Nickel. Uh, this was a few years ago, and they came up with an idea for installing a living shoreline. Um, and then I came on board, and I came back and said, well, I think we need to look at a few more things. I don't want this to be a Band-Aid. So I had them go through to some money we received from U.S. Fish and Wildlife to do a further study of wind and water action. Because what I didn't want to see was this be a Band-Aid uh, effect to try to fix this erosion issue and have us have to come back in three or four years and redo it. So as a result of that study, what we realized is there's two things. Water coming through our inlet at a high tide has this eddying effect right by this inlet wall. And it would circle around, circle around, and start scouring this edge along this marsh, along the, the shoreline. It hit the riprap and dissipated, which is what the riprap was supposed to do. But what we also saw was water that made it through the channel, went direct, hit this wall on the other side. Let me get that. And then it went east and then started coming around this corner. And that started removing uh, soil on this eastern edge. So we, we were really worried about that. And luckily, we have a pretty good idea of what's causing the, um, the erosion along both areas. Unfortunately, we've also seen erosion on these two islands. This island here used to be about three times its size. Now it's, you can see it's very much smaller than that. At a king tide, it's all underwater. Um, at a normal mean high tide, you can see about the top foot of it. So it's been melting away um, gradually over the last 10 years. The biggest reason why we're concerned about it, number one, we don't want to lose any more shoreline. But number two, right along the southern edge are telephone poles. And this telephone, these telephone poles here, and they continue on the other side, is what feeds electricity to the um, stoplight at Brookhurst and PCH. Even though that is owned by Caltrans, since we own the property, they say it's our problem, not theirs. So that's what we're going to do there is we're going to install this living shoreline along the eastern edge. We have to be really careful on how we do it for a number of reasons, because we're actually working in the marsh itself. Uh, we're going through and looking at all of the permitting requirements. Uh, what we ended up doing is we decided we're going to work along this edge first up to the riprap and a little bit of this island. And the main reason we're doing that is because we're trying to keep within the 500 linear feet requirement from Nationwide 54 permit from uh, U.S. Uh, Coastal Commission. This uh, other eastern edge looks to see uh, at this point like it stopped receding. So we're going to give that a while, give it a couple of years and see what happens. Plus, we also want to see what we do with the living shoreline along the southeastern edge and see if maybe that is holding it up and actually bringing back that, that uh, surface. And then we can look at applying for an additional permit later to cover this uh, southeastern uh, portion of the shoreline. If anybody has any questions, if they want to hold up their hand, I'll try to answer those. Uh, I'm in full screen mode, so I may not be able to see those. So Jen, you might be the one that takes a look at that. Sounds good. So this is the concept we're going to be using. So along most of the areas, we're calling it a living shoreline because it will be all um, natural products with one exception. We've got one area that is receding at a higher rate than a half a foot. And we need to shore up that, um, that area to make it really strong. So in this one area only, and it's about 15 linear feet, we're going to be installing a filter fabric. And the filter fabric is going to go along the base of where the, um, the erosion is occurring right now. That'll be a man-made product that uh, will not go away over, except for over a very long period of time. Then we're going to put cobble here. So some would argue that cobble is a stone. It's not a living object, and we agree, but it's not concrete. We're not doing anything like that in there. Then we're going to be putting a sheet of uh, core, core fiber across the top of that with soil, core logs at the base. This area right here, as you can tell by the line, will be right uh, just above sea level. So that's where we're going to start the base. Putting in things like core grass, more core logs, um, higher marsh plants up along the plus five area, so pick a weed, some of the salt marsh grasses that start to show up in that area, building up another base, and then continue that up the hillside. The idea is these uh, cobble soil burritos, as we're calling them. Obviously, the, the person that made up this vernacular is not Hispanic because that is not a burrito. 
Um, <laughs> the idea is the water will bring sand in, the sand will settle. When the water goes out, the water goes out, the sand will stay behind the, uh, the burritos. And that's what we're gonna use all the way up this line. As we start building up the shoreline, then we're just gonna stack another cobble burrito on top of that and just keep building it up as the shoreline uh, goes throughout the years. Because we know this lower level because it is uh, the uh, coconut fiber logs, we know those will dissolve over time. But what we're hoping to do is build up enough of them and stake them in the ground, uh, wooden stakes, so that we can build up the shoreline. Next project we're gonna talk about is the restoration of the Upper Magnolia Marsh. So along the Magnolia Marsh at the very Northern edge is an area, this is triangle right here, that's called Upper Magnolia Marsh. We did a very small restoration that's the water you see on, on the screen back in 2010 when we actually did the restoration for Magnolia Marsh. But we had to stop at that small restoration. And the reason for that is this existing oil gas pipeline that shows in the screen. <clears throat> There's a series of pipelines that are right here on our marsh <clears throat> that were put back in the 1900s when AES power plant used to be run by crude oil. So across the street, we had, across the channel, I should say, we had these um, gas tank, oil tanks that were there that stored crude oil that would go along the pipes, along our bridge, along our property, into the AES property when the generators were run by crude oil. Well, in the 1980s, the um, facility got converted over to natural gas and they stopped using crude oil in the AES power plant, but they never did anything about the pipeline or about the tanks. Then we had this little thing in the 70s called deregulation. And that's when Southern California Edison got broken up and they were very smart and said, we're no longer gonna be involved with the manufacture of electricity we're just gonna be in charge of distribution. So they own all the lines that go from the electrical power plants, but they don't know the power plants. So in this case, a company called AES owns the facility here in um, Huntington Beach. They also own the plants in uh, Long Beach and uh, some of the plants that are out in Redondo Beach as well. Well, when they sold the, pro the property to uh, AES, AES has maintained this property and they never wanted to do anything about it. They still had the old boilers there. They've done some other work. And then about six years ago, seven years ago, they got it approved to put a brand new power plant system on their AES power plant. And it's located right here where this power plant itself used to be. And this new one is in the back of the plant rather than the front of the property because it, it is an air-cooled generator while the other ones that are on long PCH the four generators there, there's two generators per stack, are actually um, once through cooling, they're seawater cooled. So that's why they were allowed to build these in the back. Well, when they did that, the AES had to remove these tanks, the pipeline on their property, and the pipeline that went all the way over to the power plants because it was in the way of this new power plant they're building up. So at that time, the company that owns the pipeline on our property and the tanks on the other side, which is a company that used to be called Plains All-American, decided that they were gonna sell the tank farm, which they've done. They've sold it to a company called Shop Off Property. So we've been after them for some time saying, okay, you no longer have your, prop your pipeline on AES. You've sold the Shop Off Property. We wanna get this pipeline removed. And they agreed to it, but they never came up with a timeline. Then I came on board. My strong suit is negotiating contracts. I've been doing that for four decades. I got them to come to the table and agreed that they would finally go ahead and, release and remove this pipeline, which we're in the process of doing right now. So we're in the permitting process. We're hoping to get the permit, the last permit, which is from U.S. Coastal Commission uh, in the next month or so. <clears throat> and we're hoping that we can actually do the removal and then the restoration before next year's baby season, nesting season. So that's what we're attempting to do there. Uh, the biggest problem that we have with some of the pipeline is there's been some metal leaching into the ground. Uh, we know that because some of the metal stanchion holding the pipelines have deteriorated. The other problem that we have, <clears throat> excuse me, is right here in Upper Magnolia Marsh, right where the big M for marsh is, there's an old oil well there that was capped off in 1974 that the uh, city is saying that we need to go through and make sure that it was capped properly. And we're arguing we're not even going to be anywhere near that for the restoration because we're going to be over here 
And what the city came back to us with was, well, we'll let, we'll wait and see what the state comes back with. If they don't, if they say you don't have to do it, then that's fine. But if they say that we, that you need to look at uh, recertifying the capping of that well, then that's what you're going to have to do. And so far, the Coastal Commission has told us they're fine with the grading that we want to do and where it's located that we shouldn't be doing anything to disturb that cap. So this is what the property looks like now. And you can see the pipeline on our property. And this is the area that we're going to be doing the restoration on. Third project I want to talk about is a project called the Corgrass Project. And this is currently working with Edison High School. So what we designed here, and this was actually designed by the, uh, Greg Gardner, uh, the teacher at Edison High School, myself, and a 10th grade student. We designed the tanks and tank systems. And then the three of us I just named with 10 other students built all of this. So the good thing for us, it's no permit required because none of this is affixed to the ground. It's all freestanding. So as a result of that, does not require a permit in the city of Huntington Beach. So what we have here are holding tanks that hold approximately 400 gallons of salt water that we have plumbed into these uh, growing tanks, which are another 400 gallon tanks, that we put soil in and salt water, because I'm very lucky, not only am I located next to a marsh, I also get free salt water from AES, because as I told you, the other uh, units up here are um, water cooled. And so we get free uh, ocean water, salt water from them. So that that's what we have in here. And then we've designed the system so that there is electrical, kind of like what you would have for your sprinkler system at home, a timer that's on here. So we uh, simulate a, two high tides and two low tides a day. I told my students I was not going to require them to come out and change the times every day. So we just put it on a six hour cycle. It goes on for six hours, goes off for six hours, goes on for six hours, goes off for six hours. And then we have a gravity flow system built in the growing tanks. So we maintain the water at a specified level. And then when the um, tank shut off or the, um, the sump pump shut off, then there's a gravity flow system that will take it to a certain level only. And that empties the uh, salt water from the holding tank, from the growing tank into the holding tank. And this is done twice a day. And what we're doing is we're using the first system is going to mimic, that's our control, is going to mimic um, Magnolia Marsh. The second and third system, we're going to alter. So in this case, the second system, we're going to add six, inch, add six inches more water than what's in the control. And in the third one, we're going to do six inches or less. But we're all going to also alter things like pH, salinity, look at soil uh, composition, adding minerals, taking away minerals, things like that, so we can see at the end of the day what our result, results show us, hopefully, is what is the best uh, solution for optimizing gro growth of core grass. Uh, what I want to do with these students, and they're all seniors in high school this year, is get them to finish this project, and we're working on it every week, so that at the end of the year, I would like them to write a paper on it, and I want to get their paper, if at all possible, uh, presented to a peer-reviewed journal so they could have that as part of their portfolio. Fourth and last project to talk about is the acquisition of Newland Marsh. So as I mentioned before, we have Newland East, Newland North, Newland West, which is actually broke up into two pieces of property. Um, and this is what we've just finished the funding on, $2.6 million dollars to acquire all four pieces of property. Now, because this is owned by Caltrans, I cannot unfortunately buy directly from them. It's against the law for them to sell it to a private entity unless they go through private, private excuse me, public auction, which they did not want to do. So they sur surplus this property in 2005. They went out to four organizations to see who wanted to buy it. And the only group that came back that said they were interested was, was us. So we've been working since 2005 to try to acquire the property. Around 2010, we were able to receive a million dollars that's been held in the U.S. Coastal Conservancy's banks uh, through a, um, a lawsuit that resulted in mitigation dollars of a million dollars from a company. And that was held um, more or less in escrow by the Conservancy until we could find the additional funds. I came on board in 2016. Since then, I was able to get an additional $400,000 from U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And I finally, uh, at the end of last year, was able to uh, 
get a grant from a wildlife conservation board for the re remaining roughly $1.1 million we needed to get the 2.6 we need to acquire. So that's what we're doing right now. We're trying to close up all the documentation. Caltrans is actually gonna be selling the uh, property to uh, State Coastal Conservancy, and then the, who's another state agency, so they can do that. And then the Coastal Conservancy is then gonna deed the property over to uh, Hindi Beach Weather Conservancy. I have a approximately $200,000 um, that I have from additional grant I received from US Coastal Commission that I'm using to help me support coming up with a 30% plan, which is the engineering plan we have to have. Uh, it has to be up to 30% of what the final product is gonna be. And that's what we have to submit to all the permitting authorities uh, to review. Once we get their feedback, we get the EIR report, we get all the work we need to for CEQA document, we go through public hearings, city council meetings, all the rest of the um, alphabet soup that has to see it, we get their feedback and then we incorporate that feedback into our engineering and that becomes a 70% uh, engineering. And at that point, um, permits are issued, hopefully, and then we can start work. And the last 30% is basically just tidying things up as, as we actually do the work because things usually come up as you're doing the um, restoration. So our plan right now is acquire it, like I said, in 2020, continue doing the planning in 2021, start the permitting in 2021. It will be completed, we hope, by the end of 2022. And if not, we're looking at uh, 2022 or 2023 as a potential beginning the restoration. And then it'll be another two years for the restoration of uh, Newland Marsh, 18 months to two years. Now the difference in Newland Marsh is while the other three tides, uh, excuse me, the other three marshes are full tidal uh, marshes, slight difference in elevations just because of the distance that the water has to go from the inlet all the way up to Magnolia Marsh, for example. We decided that we're gonna make this a muted tide in Newland. So we're gonna be putting some culverts in, um, three along one side, and we're actually gonna end up putting two along the western edge. We don't have the other one marked on this particular version I'm looking at. And the reason we're gonna do that is we're, we are gonna control the amount of uh, salt water that goes into this marsh. So uh, there's gonna be two sets at each of these locations. One will be at about plus one and a half feet um, above sea level. The second set will be at about plus four and a half feet above sea level. The idea behind putting the tidal gates in there is the lower ones will close when water gets below one and a half feet or one and, one and a half feet and then starts going below that. That's so we don't trap any animals or anything inside the culverts while it's at a low tide. But we'll always maintain a salt water in our marshes at that point. Then as tide comes in, the lower ones will continue and stay open, but the upper ones will close at plus four and a half feet, thereby we will no long, we will no, not have uh, more than four and a half feet of elevation of salt water in any of our marshes at any one time. And that's to make sure we don't have issues with king tides or extremely high tides or, or high tides with rain conditions. Uh, we will be able to limit um, how much water is in our marshes at that point. The city of Huntington Beach was very happy to hear that because they don't want to see Beach Boulevard flooded over. The housing tract to the north of us was very happy because they don't want to see their property underwater. So it was Newland Street for the city again. And also, of course, this trailer park um, that's been there for quite some time were happy because they didn't want to see any of the properties there flooded as well. So that's what we're going to be doing in Newland Marsh. Um, again, it'll be probably 2023. It's more optimistic. Uh, it'll happen then than 2022 at this point, just because of the timing to get all the funding on it go through the permitting cycle, and then actually do the work of restoration. So native nursery, uh, we currently have a native nursery that can house up to 7,000 plants. Um, we're hoping to, we already have the um, hydroponic beds for core grass. We would like to use those in the future to study uh, eelgrass and maybe some other plants uh, in future with working with students from various schools I now have students coming in from uh, Huntington Beach High School and soon to be Marina High School wanting to do projects on the marshes. Um, we always use our native nursery as we're for a staging area uh, for plants that we're gonna replant in our marshes, either to support salt marsh birch beak, 
which we do about a thousand plants a year. We plant to support the Salt Marsh Birds League project, especially in all three marshes. We're going to be housing about 1,500 plants in the, um, our nursery to support the Upper Magnolia Marsh and the uh, restoration, and then another 2,000 when we do the Living Shoreline project. And then further down the road, we'll be storing some plants in there as we get ready for Newland Marsh, the completion of the Newland Marsh restoration. Um, so this is what we're doing a lot of the work inside of our native nursery. Whoops, let me back up. We also work the Huntington Beach Tree Society. Uh, in right now, we're looking at doing some work with native milkweed for the monarch butterfly. In the past, they were doing some work with drought tolerant succulents and selling those at various venues which was advantageous for us because the proceeds after they replenished their stock of materials, some of it would go to the conservancy to pay for the water for the irrigation system and anything they had left over would go to our wildlife care center to support the animals there. And then we're starting up new programs for students uh, to plant plants anywhere between one and 3000 uh, plants per year and that's to support all the projects that we have. And it's not just planting, we're taking groups like from sustainability, AP biology, uh, some of the other apes groups and having them come in to actually learn about the plants, nurture the plants, uh, grow them and uh, take care of them within our nursery until such time as they actually get to plant them and then they'll be involved with the planting as well. So education programs, just to give you an idea, pre-COVID, um, I usually have between 100 and 125 students out at our marshes um, during the school year. And it's from AP Biology, again, uh, sustainability. Um, there's actually, believe it or not, a uh, biology lit class in Huntington Beach High School. And these are students that want to do work uh, out in the marshes as a result of papers that they need to do in order to pass the, for the, their classes. So they're looking at um, plants, they're looking at soil composition, they're looking at what can be done to support like the Salt Marsh Birds Beach project. And we allow them to come out and actually do field work on our marshes. And we, the Conservancy, buy all the test equipment so that they don't have to, nor do the school. So we provide all of the water testing kits, soil testing kits. I have a uh, 50 foot trailer in our back of our property. It's a brand new one that was donated to us and inside there's labs. So they can, there's microscopes, they can perform all the testing in there and there's computers and that's the work they've been doing. So I've been doing that with Edison High School for the last two years, three years now. And just this year it's opened up to Huntington Beach High School and I'm trying to get Marina there, but it may not be until after COVID-19 that we break that uh, logger jam and they can start coming out to us. Um, like I said, I'm working with the biology lit class to get to, to have them uh, work some programs. And they're actually going to be coming out as well and helping the students from Edison High School. So we have a little crosstown rivalry that's going away because um, they want to support that the core grass project as well. So that'll be interesting to see the students working together for that particular project. And then I don't know if you're aware of it, but the Huntington Beach High School District requires 15 hours volunteer hours per semester. So we've been allowing students to come out onto our marshes for their community service activity. Now, I know that you run into a diff little bit of difficulty with trying to do that on the Bolsa Chica wetlands, and that's because they're owned by the state of California. And uh, my understanding in talking with um, uh, the folks over in the Bolsa Chica Conservancy, the Wetlands Conservancy, is that the state has pretty much still said and mandated no, we're not going to do this it's until such time as the governor has released some of the requirements on the marshes um, to allow more uh, individuals to go out there, and especially with these group type efforts. Um, my board has taken the um, opinion of we're still going to meet city, county and state requirements, but we've got 127 acres. I think I can give you six feet of separation. So whenever we have groups out here, we try to do it in groups of less than 20. No group will be higher than 20. And then on top of that, we still separate groups. So as we're doing projects, we may have 20 students working on trash pickup, but they're spread across three different marshes. Or we may have 20 people from another organization that's coming out and help us out. But again, they're spread across uh, three different uh, marshes, 127 acres. So we're still meeting the, the state requirements 
but we're opening it up for more and more individuals to come out and help us with the various projects we have on our, on our marshes. And then uh, I did connect with Huntington Beach City School District pre-COVID, and we were actually developing some project-based learning programs for K through eight, but it all got stopped as a result of COVID. So we'll have to wait until the uh, schools open up again, and then we'll begin in, be, uh, developing some projects for K through eight there as well. And then we're also looking, I, am, I have developed some wetland, uh, soil and water labs, and these are with college students. So I've got two college students going to Cal State Long Beach. One's going to, uh, can't think of the other college you're going to, and one's going to uh, OCC. So they're coming out, and as a result of the other programs I'm talking about, we're doing some uh, wetland, soil, and water labs. So they're, I'm using them to help us perform monitoring. So we're doing pre-restoration -mo pre monitoring. We're going to be doing some monitoring during the restorations. And then we'll be doing monitoring as a requirement for most of the um, granting authorities for at least six months to a year post-restoration. Um, so as a result of that, we're establishing the labs right now so people can go out and do the soil and water samples for the pre-restoration work that we're doing. That's it. That's the Reader's Digest version of what's going on at the uh, Huntington Beach Wetlands Conservancy. Thank you. Any questions? Come on, Victor. I know you're waiting. Oh, you know, I've got lots of questions. <laughs> let, uh, let me start with a simple one. John, well, first of all, thank you very much. It's a tremendously uh, informative presentation. Uh, I personally haven't kept up with uh, news from the Conservancy of, as well as I should have, considering that I was one of the founding board of directors of the, of the Conservancy back in the 80s. Uh, my first question is, uh, what about the corner of Beach Boulevard and PCH, a, a property there that, I, that I've long referred to as the boatyard? We used all to have boats on there so what is um, what's the future of that spot well right now the the company that owns that is actually the same company that owns the trailer park that's there okay. mills oh. they've owned that property for decades oh that's true we were actually true. talking with mills uh about i guess 10 years ago when uh, right after um when we were looking at Magnolia Marsh, we were trying to figure out what we want to do with Newland Marsh. And we had received our first million dollars from um, that was held in escrow by the State Coastal Conservancy. We got really close working with them and the city of Huntington Beach to do a land swap. City of Huntington Beach was going to offer up like five acres because that's about a five acre piece of property. And we are really close to getting that deal done. And unfortunately, the patriarch for the family passed away and the rest of the, the family saw dollar signs and said, forget it. We know we can make millions and millions and millions of dollars on that. So that got taken off the table back in 2010 when the, the patriarch uh, passed away. So I've had a number of discussions with Mills since then, since I've been on board. And one of the things I keep reminding them is even though it's zoned as coastal, right now, it's not technically considered a wetland. It is because it's degraded wetland that was there 100 years ago, but it's zoned as coastal. So they can build on it a little bit, not a lot. Once we restore it, they can't build anything within 100 feet of the wetlands. Oh. The biggest piece of property they have, there's one section that's 200 feet by 200 feet. Everything else is 100 feet deep. So unless they build a, a hotel similar to the Paseo or the Hilton, but they build it straight up, they can't build anything there. So I'm still working with them, but I don't have as much leverage, one, because it's not in our name yet, and two, um, because it hasn't been restored. So I'm still working with them to see if there's something that we can do. Plus, now with the new um, city council, I have to work with them to see if they're willing to look at doing the land swap. But that's what we are, we've been wanting to do for 10 years now. The idea for us is if we are able to get that piece of property, I'd love to put a small interpretive center on that corner. Beautiful location. And then what I would also like to do is put a boardwalk along that edge of what the boatyard used to be um, and the, uh, the new Newland Marsh. So people can come off the beach 
uh, off of PCH, park in our little interpretive center and walk along that boardwalk right there and overlook the marsh. So I have long-term plans, but until I can get the other dance partner to the dance, there's not much I can do with that. Well, I'm pleased to hear that you've been able to communicate at all with uh, Mills Land and Water. Uh, yep. There was really bad blood there back in, in my era. I yes. hope that that's, that's an era that's in the past and you can communicate better. Yes, thank you. I've got a lot more questions, but I see other hands, so I'll let others. Right. Go ahead. Jerry? Um, you do extensive, am I, is my mic on? Yes. Oh, you, you do extensive educational programs. How, how do you staff that with personnel? Are you on site for these? And, and, and where's the, is the data stored somewhere where we could look at what you're doing? So uh, for a lot of the work, as far as the field work, I'm going out there with the students and I, I know how to read a lab kit. I know how to read how to do the, the test. But I also have Greg Gardner and I have a couple other teachers that help support me. So like I said, I'm the first one long time ago to realize if I don't have a subject matter expert around, I don't pretend like I know what I'm talking about. So I'll bring the SMEs out there and get them the ones to actually do the work and answer the questions. So I have a couple of docents that I'm working with, a couple of ex-teachers that are helping me out, developing the test, um, the lab criteria, making sure we have all the equipment, what do we need, they're the ones that are developing that. Now, historically, the work, um, I know exactly how many students I've had on a per year basis and for what school they're at. And in the case of student papers, I've got copies of their papers. So I know what type of work they've been doing. We've had uh, one student, family lived in Pasadena, but she was going to the University of Edinburgh. She did a one year study in our marches and I have a copy of her paper. I currently have two PhD, PhD students from uh, USC doing some research on the, in the marshes for this year. So I'm hoping to get uh, their results in the next year or two, because I think theirs are two years projects, not one year projects. Um, as I get this, you're, you'll be more than happy to come by and take a look at some of those, because not everything I have is electronically. Some of the kids just came by and handed me a copy of their paper. But yeah, I'd be more than happy to work with you guys on that and have you take a look and see some of the projects and things we're working on. And when you say come by, do you mean the wildlife and care center or do you have that trailer you're talking about in the No, back? no, no. I, my, uh, office, my office is in the main building. Which so is, the wildlife care center is only half of that first building. The okay. other half of that building is our interpretive center and where my oh, office is located. Thank you. And I'm, I'm there... It used to be five days a week. Now it's six days a week because most of my students from medicine can only come in on Saturdays. So yeah, that's kind of my life for a while. Thank you. Yep. Martin, I thought I saw your hand up. Any chance to get in the trailer park? No. <laughs> I don't think I have or the city has enough money to buy that. No, nope, I can't see that ever happen. The only way I could see that happen is if Mother Nature does it for me. And sea level rise causes them a problem. It's, it's the best residential place on planet Earth. <laughs> right next to Pacific Coast Highway in Huntington Beach, California. You couldn't top that anywhere. Yeah, the only, other, the only one that, that comes close is the one that's on the other side of PCH. The other questionable piece of property that we won't get into on tonight's talk. Any other questions? One other one on the uh, bird speak stuff. Do you raise your own seed material? No, then? no. I work with Tidal Influence, and they have a take permit from you, uh, California Fish and Wildlife that allows them to go collect the uh, seeds, and they collect them over at Newport Back Bay. And then they store them at their facility and then they bring them on site when we seed them under the ground because it's actually against the law to plant the, the seed into a, a pot and then try to replant it. Would if you, you kill it, funny. you get in trouble. So that's okay. why they say okay. just eat it and see what happens. Would you mind putting up your last slide in your presentation briefly? Sure. That one? Not up, John. All right. Let 
Now can you see it? Yes, thank you. Oh yeah, good idea. So during non-COVID times, we'd only open our interpretive center every Wednesday from 10 to 2, and the second and fourth Saturday from 10 to 2. And then the third, third Saturday of the month is when we do our uh, community event from 9 to 12. Um, because of the way COVID has made things work out, what I'm telling people is if you want to come in for a tour, give me a call. As long as it's less than 20 people, I'll set it up for you. Not a problem. I can send you a copy of this presentation as well, Jan, if you want. Yeah, that would be awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have any more questions? I've got a, a follow-up question about the uh, the restoration of Newland uh, Newland Marsh, John. Yeah. Could you could you expand a little bit about the flap gate structure or or control structure to let water out of the channel onto either side of the channel? Yeah, we're trying to find a way. We're looking at the mechanical gates that, that are over that you have in Bolsa Chica. And we're also looking at the mechanical gates that are over on, on the Santa Ana Riverbed that go into um, basically the, the, the marsh area that's on the other side of the Santa Ana Riverbed from us. What we want to do is try to find a way that we can turn it from a mechanical tidal gate uh, to one that we can put timers on uh, to open it up. Or is there a way that we can put the, the flat valves that are on the edge of those position in a way that the, the force of the water, either going up or down, will allow them to open or close? It, but we want to try to do with as minimum of uh, pieces as we can, because we also don't want it to be a, a maintenance nightmare. Well, I wondered if, if your intention of having two on each side was that one would be an in and one would be an out that kind of flow? No, we're actually doing it. We've got two at either end just to allow a, an even distribution of water when it goes in. So it's not okay. just coming in at one spot. Uh, and it'll be a steadier flow because it'll be at two points of entry rather than a single point. Because we're only talking about putting uh, one and a half to two foot diameter culverts. Uh, we know if we go anything bigger than that, we run into uh, other problems because um, we've, we've done that in some of our other marshes and we, we just don't want to go beyond that because we're also trying to maintain the, uh, the flow of water by us controlling how much goes in and out. So the way we're managing, inf managing inflow and outflow is by the, the position at the plus one and a half feet and plus four and a half feet. So the plus one and a half will allow everything to drain out as uh, the water goes down. And when it gets below four and a half feet, the top culverts, the flat valves will close. So nothing can get inside there or can get trapped in there. And it'll continue going down until you get to that one and a half feet. So at one and a half feet, the lower edge of that culvert will be at plus one and a half feet. Um, the flat valve will close with the water level going down. And as soon as it gets to the um, plus one and a half feet, the valve will be in a shut position. So then as water starts to come in and gets pushed through the culvert flap, it'll push the flap open, allowing water to come in and it'll just do the reverse as it goes up and then it'll close off um, when it gets to that plus four and a half. Uh, I, I guess that's what I miss, must have misunderstood in your first presentation. So at each one of the four locations, there will really be two pipes and in yes. and out at yes. each location, gotcha. Yeah, we didn't want to try, especially the Newland West, it's such a large piece of property we, we thought we would have to put, you know, really large diameter culverts in order to be able to uh, fill up 40 acres of, of, or excuse me, that was about 25 acres of property. So by putting two inlets and two outlets, we think we would be able to control the flow better. How big are the culverts going to be? We're looking at between one and a half and two feet in diameter. Now, John, you've Someone's warned you about the, 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 the lack of complete success of the flap gates at Bolsa Chica at the mouth of the of Yes, they have. The channel. Yes, so, they have. Moffat and Nickel have been very concerned about that, but they're also the ones that came up with the design. Hmm. So what we're hoping is that they can borrow and leverage some work that's been done in other estuaries 
to fix some of the issues that have happened since the ones and bolts of Chica that were introduced um, in the design that we're going to do for um, Newland Marsh. Well, I hope that they that these uh, that these structures are uh, are controllable uh, from as under under direct conscious human control as opposed to just entirely passive flapgate structures because my sus suspicion is that from time to time you'll want to uh, open them up during <clears throat> freshwater floods coming down the channel and get some oh, we all into those marshes. Yes and no. Um, we always will get continue to get fresh water from Little Shell, but that's that's pretty small, isn't it? it it's a small amount of water. There's no doubt about that. Um, but there's two culverts that go under PCH that, whenever the water gets to a certain level, it automatically drains into um, Newland Marsh. Uh, that's why one of my first activities is to try to do something with that seven acres of cattails that's over there. Um, but with the water coming down the channel, depending on when the rain event happens, um, you know, if it happens when it's other than high tide, we'll get fresh water into the marshes. And we'll get fresh water anyway, just because of the size of the, the pieces of property. So we will get some, you know, some mixture in there. There's no doubt about that. We'll get in, in both sides. Unless it happens to be a very high tide and that's when the heavy rain hits and then it'll just go right past us. Because I worry that that a, a muted tidal system like that will tend to uh, accumulate salt. And that, and that you'd really prefer uh, the occasional good freshwater flushing to get uh, excessive salt out of the system. Because you're yeah, putting you know, more salt water in than where that lower culvert is going to be. I mean, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just saying that evaporative loss as that salt water sits there will leave you salt, and what drains off will be, will be water uh, leaving salt behind. Well, we're hoping that the wash effect that happens with high tide, low tide will clear some of that out of there because yeah. we get that anyway in the other, other marshes. As water goes out, like the last couple of days, we've had this extremely low tide where you can almost walk across all of our, from one island to the next out in Magnolia Marsh, for example. But center channel has always got water in it. It never goes dry. So what we're, we're thinking about is potentially moving that lower culvert, maybe a little bit lower to help with that so we get a better wash. But that's a good point and thank you for bringing that up. Well, uh, I'm sure the Moffat Nickel will are, are, we'll think along similar lines. I sure hope so. Any other questions? No. Oh yeah, one more. <laughs> those those uh, those burritos yes. <laughs> that you talked about very at the very beginning. Uh, I, I gather that you're talking about some kind of a long tubular roll-like structure, but what are they really? So it, it's it's uh, we're going to buy it in in long sheets, long rolls, and we'll cut to the size we want. And the reason they're calling them a burrito is because our intention is um, is to take these long sheets, put soil down if we can, maybe put some oyster shells inside there, fold them over, and then sew them along the edges. So I'm well, sorry, I'm Hispanic. I call that an empanada. I don't call it a burrito, but they call it a burrito. Well, it doesn't. That's the intention. Doesn't sound like it tastes that. very good either way. But, no, it sure won't. But but what's the fabric? Uh, it's uh, coconut fiber log. Oh, that's the coconut. Okay. Yeah. I thought you were distinguishing between those and a different type of round thing that you described as. Quark. Oh, the, at so, one time, Moffat and Nickel were the concept. A lot of people use is the core logs. The choir logs. Everybody says it a little bit differently. It's a C O C O I R log. That is a different material. And what I finally convinced our board is not going that route because there's been some issues that in order for be able, for them to be able to make this log like they do, 
there's actually some plastic filaments that are inside there to help it maintain its uh, strength. And the fabric deteriorates, but the plastic doesn't. Sure. So that's why instead we're going with the coconut fiber logs and we're going to use a, a, a jute hemp string to sew them together because all of that will dissolve over time and it, it'll uh, biodegradable and it won't harm the, uh, the marsh. When do you expect that all that stuff is going to be in place, those log things? Burritos. That'll probably be next year. And the reason for that is the last minute, the city of Huntington Beach said, you know, we really think you need to go to this California State Coastal Commission to check on permitting on that. And it was too late in the season, the year by the time we got that request. So we've submitted it, submitted it to the Coastal Con uh, Commission uh, for review. And I don't think we're going to get it back in time for uh, before the next uh, nesting season. Because right where that is located, across the street, is the federal least turn preserve. And Dave. there's no way I can go out there and do any kind of work if the uh, uh, least turn nesting season has started. John, you didn't mention how the Picern Family Foundation has oh. helped. They do the tanks or what? Yeah, so what happened with that is, uh, so this is a program that started with these students when they were in 10th grade. So the Pisern Family Foundation came to Mr. Gardner. They actually don't go to the school, they go to the teacher. And they said, you know, we've seen your work, we've seen whatever it is. And in his case, it was his work and the fact he was a teacher of the year and said, we've got this fund we want to give you. In order to do this, there's two aspects of the project you have to do. So you pick 10th graders and they all have to basically bid on, to be on this program. They have to write a paper, two papers actually, um, they have to go in, fr in front of two different review cycles. And ultimately, however many students you have gets dwindled down to 10. From that 10, we now go fast forward. They now start off at 11th grade. And during their 11th grade, um, they have to do two things. One is they have to do a 40-hour sustainability project. That's the, the cord grass project. So I came up with that idea. We submitted to the Pisern family. They agreed to it and said, hey, that's really great. If you can do it, this is fantastic. Well, the second thing they were supposed to do was during the summer between 11th and 12th, Mr. Gardner and I were supposed to take these 10 students to South Africa to study uh, the black rhinos where they have cut off the horns and they've been studying those. But then this nasty thing called COVID hit and none of us could travel. So the Pisern family still gave us money in order to help build the tank systems. Um, and, but the rest of what they were supposed to give us was the money to go to South Africa. And even though COVID hit and they didn't, that didn't go forward, I tried and said, well, you know, you're, you're saving money because you're not sending this to South Africa. How about spending some more money on the cord grass project? And they wouldn't go for it. But that's, what the, that's how the Pystern Family Foundation came in. But that's not something you apply for. They come to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Marco, were you going to ask something? Yes. Um, first of all, thank you for this. This was very interesting. Um, my question is, based on what is the land owned privately or versus the state steps in and buys it? You mentioned the NBC Conservancy, uh, the area there in the upper Newport Bay is owned by the state, right? Yes. So, and just like Bosa Chica, wetlands are owned by the state of California. Okay, so how does does this work based, based on what the state owns one part and the uh, Huntington Beach wetlands own privately? Well, this was all private property down here. It was never part of the state property. Oh, the only okay. Thing that ever became part of the state property is the state beach, because okay. on the other side of PCH was never wetlands. It hasn't stopped being a wetlands uh, since 1920, or since the 20s when oil was discovered in southeastern Huntington Beach. So for decades, it was just basically salt pan lots that have been sitting around here dormant for decades, but it was owned by private companies. Some of it was, uh, in one case it was actually owned, some of it was owned by um, Orange County uh, Public Works because of the flood channels that go through there, but the rest of it was just private companies. But what happened was in the 80s, actually pre 80s, and um, Victor, you can, you can Correct me if I'm wrong. Some of this got changes and zone rezoned as coastal. 
So as a result of that, you really couldn't do much with this property down here. So that's when we stepped in and said, well, you know, let's see if we can do something to get some funds. And some of it was grants and some of it was private donations, but most of those grants uh, that allow us to go out and buy the property. Now, the good thing is because it was private entities, we could actually set up mitigation banks to help us pay for the restoration. In this situation with Newland, we can't do that. And that's because it's all state uh, funds primarily that are uh, helping us buy the property. And they won't let us set up a mitigation bank for that. So all we right. have to go get our funding separately. Thank you. Mm -hmm.